Stone? All right. So, as was said, in 2012, April of 2012, I finished the first ever nonstop single-handed circumnavigation of the Americas, which is a long sentence. <laughs> what that means is I sailed out of Annapolis, went between Canada and Greenland over uh, the top of Canada, which is the Northwest Passage, around the entire state of Alaska, down the Pacific, around Cape Horn, and then back up to Annapolis. It was that simple. And uh, I did it nonstop. Nonstop means nonstop. So you can't go to port, you don't drop an anchor. It is a nonstop trip, and I was alone. Um, probably ask yourself, why in the world would anybody want to do that? Uh, in my case, I was doing a, uh, a fundraiser for a charity called CRAB. Uh, CRAB is Chesapeake Regional Accessible Boating. They give sailing opportunities to people with mental and physical disabilities. So it was actually uh, hugely uh, successful. We raised 120000 uh, It was much more successful than I thought, but I didn't even know if I was going to make it when I left. You know, I was like, well, I might make it through the Arctic and, I don't know, Cape Horn. And I was on a 27-foot boat that was 40 years old. You could probably buy it for $5,000. So it wasn't... Uh, and a boat you'll see here in a minute is not the same boat, by the way. So when I got back from that trip, I immediately started uh, uh, building a, creating a nonprofit. And getting the 501c3 status from the IRS is like an expedition in bureaucracy, you know? I mean, it was just, uh, which was not my favorite type of expedition. But, uh, but whatever, you know, we did it. So the first expedition, I, I saw a lot of stuff floating around in the ocean while I was out there. A lot of plastic, uh, mostly, as yes, plastic floats. Uh, I wanted to head out to, the, to one of the gyres. Now, there are five gyres in our Earth's ocean. A gyre is a large area of circular current, kind of like a vortex, but very slow-moving currents. Often, these currents are associated with high-pressure systems, which means light winds. So there are often areas with these vortexual currents in the doldrum, uh, somewhere near the middle, if not in the middle. So you have one in the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, and one in the Indian Ocean. The problem is that if you throw a plastic bottle in the ocean, more than likely it's going to wind up in one of these gyres. So the, but the problem is, as, as was spoken earlier about rights, having rights of a river, it's hard to have rights of the ocean because the ocean isn't part of any country. And often it's out of sight, out of mind, so it's hard to know just how much is out there. Now, I wanted to head out into the middle of the Atlantic because it sounded like a good idea. No, I wanted to head out there because nobody has done this marine plastics research uh, in that part of the ocean, mostly because it's such a remote part of the ocean. It is the middle of the uh, North Atlantic gyre or the Atlantic garbage patch. There is a Pacific garbage patch, as it has been deemed. You can call this the, the uh, brother, the Atlantic garbage patch. Uh, and so the idea was to go out there working with other universities. And what Ocean Research Project does is we work with uh, scientists, universities, organizations to collect scientific data. We shoot documentaries while we're doing it. The idea is to make a documentary that's not too educational because you want people to learn without knowing that they're learning. You want them to enjoy, you know, watching a documentary. <laughs> Science-based documentaries typically aren't that exciting, but I make them exciting by doing, you know, having big adventure. And then we implicate that into the school system. We build curriculums working with teachers to, to, for lesson plans to teach fifth to seventh graders about this, uh, uh, these various issues. So anyways, we head out to sea. So the first 2,200 miles uh, we had to sail just to get to where we're going to go research, which is a very long commute to work. And, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it was, everything was pretty good along the way. Uh, we had a tropical storm that went north of us, but it wasn't that big of a deal. We kind of just went south, and, and for the most part, everything went well. Now, you do see uh, a variety of different plastics uh, floating around in the ocean. Now, there's a major misconception when it comes to these uh, garbage patch. People think, and most people think, that there is an island of garbage out in the ocean, or a mound of garbage in the ocean. That does not exist. That is a huge misconception. There is no such thing as an island of garbage. I wish there was, because it would be much easier to go out and clean up. If it was all in one area, we could just go clean it up. The problem is these gyres are huge, and this, this plastic is spread out in an area roughly one-third of the size of the continental United States. So they're vast areas. Now, they do clump together a little bit here and there, but there is no such thing as an island of garbage. And like I said, it would be a lot easier to deal with this if there was. So what we did, me and one scientist, Nicole, uh, who's quite the trooper, went out and deployed something called a manta net. This is the standardized form of data collection. What you want to do is you want to do the, you want to do the research the same way people are doing it in other oceans and other organizations so you could compare and contrast your data. If everybody does the research the same, you can get a general uh, data set that can be used. So a manta net, uh, it just skims the surface. No, you're not trying to clean up. There was, a, there was an interesting idea given by a, a teenager that's kind of went viral about this idea of how to clean up the oceans in five years with these robots. Really cool idea, but it's not feasible with our technology. It, it can't happen. The problem is that the oceans are so vast and also a very difficult place to hang out. Uh, hurricanes go ripping through this area and tropical storms at least one a year, typically, uh, through that region. 
So it would destroy any, any uh, vessels. They say that it would take uh, 64 vessels working 24 hours a day, 10 years to clean it up. But the problem is that if you clean up all these little plastic pieces floating along, and we're talking about plastic the size of your fingernail or smaller, you're going to eliminate and collect a lot of the life. There's a whole layer of life just at the surface in the ocean. So here's an example of a little sample. Uh, this was just a two-mile. This manna net is only two feet at the mouth. And we just pulled it for two miles in the middle of the ocean, and we got all this, this uh, plastic. Uh, I counted this out in the lab uh, not too long ago, and it was hundreds of pieces. They think that there's 64,000 pieces of plastic per square mile uh, in, in these regions. I mean, it's just uh, absolutely incredible. But anyways, after 26 days straight, me and Nicole deployed and redeployed these nets over an area, that little zigzag you saw, over an area about 2,500 miles. Day in, day out. Uh, if it's 3 in the morning, we're doing it. If it's 3 at night, uh, we're always uh, uh, taking samples, storing samples. She's a scientist. I'm not a scientist. So, you know, she's the captain of science, and I just kind of do what she says. But, uh, but anyway, so we did this, and, and everything went really well. And on day 46, we ended our research. And on day 47, we started heading home. And we had about 1,500 miles to get back. And, you know, like I say, everything had been going really well up to this point, which is obviously, you know, a bad sign. But, uh, <laughs> but I go out and I make us a nice little dinner, and, and I'm, uh, I bring it out, and Nicole's sitting there, and she looks out in the distance, and she sees a, a mast floating around, a, a boat. You know, we just see this mast out there. And we haven't seen any sailboats since we left. And so, you know, I'm thinking, you know, maybe we can get a bottle of wine off these guys, you know. So <laughs> it's, we play this game to see if we can ever get a bottle of uh, booze from a freighter, which never works, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> but we ask them when they pass by. But so we get over and we get closer and we notice the sails are dragging in the water. And, uh, you know, like, what's going on here? This is, this is obviously not right. Uh, and so I jump in this little kayak we had and I paddle over because either somebody is dead, somebody's injured, or the boat has been abandoned. So I get aboard the boat and I start looking around. Now, this is not an ordinary boat. This is a 48-foot swan. This is like finding a Rolls Royce floating around in the engine. This is a million-dollar boat that somebody, I found out later, somebody abandoned it uh, back in February. Uh, because he couldn't get his engine started, which is a terrible reason to abandon ship. But uh, anyways, uh, the good news was that nobody was injured and nobody uh, uh, needed medical help. So if we can pull this boat back to Bermuda, we would get enough funds to fund like the next three or four expeditions, you know, I mean. <laughs> but the problem is we're 700 miles east of Bermuda. We're about 1,500 miles east of the uh, United States. We're way out in the ocean and we find this thing. We didn't have much fuel, so we found a freighter. We didn't get alcohol, but we did a... Uh, we did convince them to give us some fuel. So you never want to be this close to a freighter in the ocean, like never. And uh, if you even just touch that freighter, you're going to like destroy everything. You know, it's like a giant uh, wall of steel next to you. And so we get this fuel, and, uh, and uh, over an hour we get it on board, and now this is like an ultimate high point. We got the 50 gallons of diesel that we needed so we can get in there. And uh, freighters don't run on diesel, they run on something called bunker. But they carry a little bit of diesel to start their auxiliary engine. How often do they start their auxiliary engine? Probably not very often. So who knows how long this diesel had been sitting in a tank. We took a risk, and unfortunately, we broke our injection pump on the engine. Now, there's a lot of things you could fix, uh, but an injection pump is not one of them. So we spent the next uh, 24 days becalmed at sea. Now, uh, you know, a sailboat without a, uh, without a sail and an engine is, is, you know, just a piece of floatsome. And just like the 48-foot the boat, this was like the world's largest piece of marine debris, uh, we, too, for a, for a period of time, became, uh, you know, well, marine debris to some extent. Uh, and it's this doldrum area, and this is why. Like I was saying, these areas are associated with these light winds. But after 24 days, we slowly were able to make our way over, and uh, we got to Bermuda, and this, this boat came in, this pilot boat, and towed us in just as tropical storm. This was a tropical depression, Durian, but it was a tropical storm just a couple days before, and that's what's sitting there. That's the beginning of it. And so they throw our boat at this dock. They, like, just let the line go and chuck us. And, you know, we got no engine, and it's blowing 50 knots and raining sideways. This thing is, like, crashing lightning on us. And anyways, we pull off, and I fix the boat. And we had been at sea for 73 days by this point. Um, but, you know, I, I spent 309 days, uh, you know, out at sea last time. And you guys are more than welcome to come with me next time if you want. You know, it's, just, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a good... I did lose 30 pounds on this trip, so uh, it's freeze-dried food. But... Uh, Anyways, just let's look at plastic. The worldwide, uh, annually, worldwide, 300 million tons of plastic is made every year. 300 million. 6.4 million tons gets dumped in the ocean, and that's what we know of. 
So I'm sure there's a bunch of other plastic that we don't know of getting dumped. Now, just to get a visual of what 6.4 million tons is, you'd have to take semi-trucks bumper to bumper for 1,500 miles and fill all of them with plastic to be able to have 15, uh, 6.4 million tons of plastic. So that's a whole lot. Uh, now, only 8% of all the plastic that gets made every year ends up getting recycled. And as I said earlier, about 46,000 uh, pieces in the ocean. A lot of things are made of plastic. Computers, uh, uh, TVs, your bumper maybe on your car. Uh, but let's look at something, you know, just focus on one aspect of plastic. Plastic bags. So every year, annually, a trillion plastic bags are used worldwide. A trillion. 102 billion in this country alone, and 11% uh, gets recycled, 10% winds up in the ocean. So almost the same amount of plastic bags that get recycled wind up in the ocean. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Now, a, the Sun Chips in 2008, they try to do something a little revolutionary. They created the first ever 100% compostable bag. Now, compostable does not mean biodegradable. If it's compostable, you need a high temperature composting facility in order for it to compost. But it's a step in the right direction. At least somebody's trying to do something different. And instead of people getting behind uh, Sun Chips and, and promoting them, uh, for trying to make some kind of change for the better, uh, their sales dropped by 11% because people said the bag was too loud. I mean, it's too loud? I mean, what are you talking about? Like, that's a crazy thing. And when I say this, I mean, like, if you roll up a bag of chips, it makes some noise. And if you roll up one of these bags, it makes, like, twice as much noise. But who cares? Like, put it in a bowl if you don't like the noise, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's still the same chip. But... After, after 18 months of, uh, you know, of sales dropping, and, and I don't blame Sun Chips for this, they had to go back to their old bag. You have to stay competitive in, in uh, business, and, uh, and so they went back after, after just 18 months of doing this. What this does, though, is it's really sad because it shows the mentality of the American consumer, uh, that we are so obsessed with comfort and convenience that even something as slightly inconvenient as a louder bag is enough for us to stop buying a product we normally buy. And, and the consumer is crucial about making change, about making a difference. How many times have you went into a 7-Eleven or wherever it is and get yourself a cup of coffee and you stirred it up with one of those stupid little plastic straws? All right? All the time. That plastic straw, you will use that plastic straw for 10 seconds of your life. That plastic straw will be on this planet after you're dead, your kids are dead, your grandkids are dead. Why are we making one-time throwawayable items out of a material that's going to be here for, for hundreds of years? So it's, it's really insanity, you know. It, it just doesn't make any sense at all, except the bottom line is that it's cheap to make it. Uh, just like styrofoam, polystyrene is very cheap to, to make. So how are we going to make a difference? Well, there are only two real biopolymers, biodegradable polymers. They're both plant-based plastics. Just because plastic is made from a plant does not mean it's biodegradable. All right? they, they can actually duplicate the same polymer as, as petroleum. Most plastic is made from petroleum. So the, the, uh, the issue is that these biopolymers uh, are much more expensive to manufacture. So the plastic industry is going to have to invest a large amount of money millions of dollars into making these truly biodegradable biopolymers uh, cheaper. Uh, and the consumer is going to have to be willing to spend a higher premium uh, for these products. So it's going to take a combination of the plastics industry and the consumer uh, in order to do this. But, you know, no plastic is made in the ocean. It all starts here on land. And when those microplastics get out to sea, uh, and they break up. You know, birds eat them, fish eat them. It's hard to know how many animals are being affected by it because if a fish dies, if it gets a belly full of plastic, it thinks it's full, it dies, it floats to the bottom of the ocean. It's a very hard place to get research, the bottom of the ocean, you know? And, uh, and birds, some birds migrate to islands. And like there was a, the island of Midway, for instance, a few years back, a guy went there with a camera. There's this thing, I think it's called the gyre or something like that. It's the most depressing thing you could ever see. Uh, and it's about, it shows how these birds are, are not just dying from it, but they're feeding it to their, their babies, you know. And, uh, but all this issue, all this problem starts right here. And if we were to, to promote this idea of this one-time throwaway, but the one-time use items, which are a huge variety of items that we have in our life, made out of a truly biodegradable biopolymer, PLA or PHA, the only two that exist, uh, then we can, really, uh, we can really eliminate a huge amount of the plastic-based trash, not just here on land, but also out at sea. 
And it's going to take, a, it's going to take an effort of both us and the, marine, and the plastics industry. So, you know, just like a lot of things, uh, we can make a difference. We are in complete control of this situation. We can be, uh, but we're going to have to work together. Uh, thank you very much.